Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the Minecraft Disney World Q&A. This is the series in which you guys give me all of your cues, anything Disney related, parks, movies, the company, uh, and I try to give you the answers to the best of my ability. This week, as usual, we're here on MC Magic, the uh, one-to-one -one recreation of Walt Disney World, and we're going to explore it a little bit, and I'm going to answer your questions. I've got a lot of great questions here. Actually, I've been so impressed with all of the great questions you guys have been throwing my way that I've actually made this a more regular series. So now, you know, this is the first week of my new schedule in which I'll be doing two videos a week uh, re regarding Disney and Minecraft, and one of them's most likely going to always be a Q&A. Uh, just because you guys are throwing so many great questions my my way every week, uh, I, I can't just ignore them. They're so good. So let's uh, just dive right in. My first question actually comes from uh, the forums, and it's ru 73 keep Choppin', who asks, uh, How do you feel about the new Haunted Mansion movie coming out soon? It will be, be it will be based around the Hatbox Ghost. Can you please explain the history of Hatbox Ghost and what you want to see in the new Haunted Mansion movie thanks have a super califragilistic expialidocious week so the hatbox ghost in the haunted mansion movie now first of all if you're not familiar there was a haunted mansion movie with eddie murphy it sort of bombed in the box office they were sort of trying to do what they did with the pirates of the caribbean but for the haunted mansion didn't work kind of was left at that however after that it was announced that a reboot was being made and Guillermo del Toro was attached. Now, you might know him as the filmmaker behind films like Pan's Labyrinth, or more recently, he did uh, Pacific Rim, the robot fighting movie. Uh, he, he's really great when it comes to uh, creating an atmosphere, and so it's actually really cool that he was attached. Uh, he's a producer and a writer, and the last I checked, he submitted a draft. Disney liked it, so I guess it's a matter of figuring out where it's going from there. They don't have a director yet. He's not actually directing the film. And he did mention that it will prominently involve the Hatbox Ghost. Now, what's the Hatbox Ghost? The Hatbox Ghost was an effect in the original Haunted Mansion in Disneyland way, way back when it opened in the late 60s. I think it was 69 when it opened. Uh, and it was the effect of this uh, ghost standing around uh, with a hat box, which is just like a big sort of cylindrical box that people put hats in. And the effect would be that uh, whenever the bride's heart would beat, the effect would change so that his head would disappear off of his body and appear in the hat box. And the problem with it was uh, it was all based on lighting and people were very close to this animatronic in the ride. And so the lighting didn't work out very well. And as a result, the effect just didn't work out to the point where Disney actually removed the hat box ghost very shortly from the ride itself. So for a majority of the ride's life, the Hatbox Ghost was not actually involved in the ride. Uh, that said, he was sort of an iconic image because he was used a lot in Haunted Mansion um, imagery, like photos and, and press and stuff like that. And there was talk a couple of years ago about bringing the Hatbox Ghost back. In fact, there was a D23 uh, uh, Into the Imagineering exhibit where they showed off a new version of the Hatbox Ghost, and I guess it worked better, but it still has yet to be put into the ride, if I recall. This would be the Disneyland version of the ride. So there's no Hatbox Ghost in the ride itself yet. Maybe there will be someday. It sounds like the movie's going to involve it heavily. It's very interesting because, you know, like when I was looking it up and sort of doing a little more research on the history of it, you know, there are a lot of people who dress up as the Hatbox Ghost, and there's a lot of fan art of the Hatbox Ghost. And it's interesting to see a ride that has such a prominent uh, icon attached to it that actually doesn't have a prominent place in the ride itself. It did, and then it was taken out. So it sort of created this lore of its own, which is very interesting. Um, how do I feel about it? I think it's a great idea. I, I am a huge fan of the Haunted Mansion. I would like to see the movie done right. Uh... I think Guillermo del Toro is a very, very talented filmmaker, so even if he's not directing it, I think his part in it will definitely help it out, and I'm excited to see what comes of it. Our next question comes from Jakey Juren, who asks, How come Spaceship Earth and the Tower of Terror seem to be so much taller than Cinderella's castle, and none of them have the light on top? Thanks. So what he's referring to is the fact that uh, in Disney, if you have a building over 200 feet, and I don't think this is Disney, I think this is just Florida in general, you're required to have a blinking light on top so low-flying aircraft can see it from afar. Uh, 
that's why Disney keeps all of these structures just under that limit so that they don't have to put that light on there and sort of ruin the atmosphere. Uh, so for to that end, the Twilight Zone, Tower of Terror, Spaceship Earth, and Cinderella's Castle, while not exactly the same height, are very, very similar, yet they do look a little different. Uh, and I think really the answer to that j just sort of chalks up to uh, optical illusions. You know, for instance, take a look at Spaceship Earth. That is a large structure. Maybe not a tall structure, but it is certainly large. It is big and round. And I think if you took images to scale of all three of these and put them next to each other, you'd see that they are actually very similar in height, but there are a lot of little tricks. Now, for instance, you have the illusion that you see here on Main Street a lot. Uh, it's called uh, it's called Force Perspective, I believe. I might be um, mixing my illusions here, but it's the idea is as you go up on the structure, the details actually get smaller and smaller so that from your perspective on the bottom, um, it feels like it's farther and farther away, and so it creates this fake illusion of added height. Now, I think one thing you could add to, I think especially with the Tower of Terror, is that they've probably improved on that illusion a lot over the years, from the creation of Cinderella's Castle to the creation of the Tower of Terror. Um, I think Spaceship Earth, you could just chalk it up to the fact that it's just a big, fat, round attraction, and, and you know, the castle by a... a comparison it gets smaller and smaller as you go up same thing with tower of terror it just sort of gets thinner and thinner uh it's 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 a fun illusion to really break apart when you're there in person because i've thought the same thing you know the tower of terror looks so much uh taller than it actually is i think part of that is just creating the illusion that you know it's higher up than it really is it's hard to give a really straight answer I, you know it's basically that's what the engineer the imagineers are there for it's there to make it look as tall as possible without actually hitting that height limit. And I think your question is just a testament to how much better they've gotten at it over the years. Next up, we have Matt Rappa who asks, What do you think of the rumor that Bob Iger could become the next commissioner of Major League Baseball? How would that affect Disney? It makes sense considering the Atlanta Braves spring training is, training is home in Disney. Perhaps the Tampa Bay Rays could be relocated within Disney and a stadium could be built around Disney Springs to be built up in that area. So, yeah, there was a rumor that the MLB is looking at Bob Iger to take over as commissioner. The big sticking point, however, to that rumor is that Bob Iger is contractually uh, signed to be CEO of Disney until 2016. They're looking for somebody a little bit sooner. Now, whether that means that MLB might try and, you know, offer a sweet enough deal that he'll break the contract and pay whatever he has to uh, is to be seen. Who knows? I think one thing you could say is that while Disney, or specifically while ESPN and the MLB might have a really nice relationship if this were to ever come to fruition, I don't think you'll see a much stronger connection beyond that. I mean, as a CEO, his job is to the company he is working for. And uh, arguably, if he switches over to the MLB, you know, his obligation will be to the MLB. And so despite having that history with Disney, I don't think that means you'll see any sweet deals where he'll move the Tampa Bay Rays over there. You know, not to argue that he doesn't care about Disney now. I'm sure he does. I, I've mentioned before that to be a CEO involves so much work that you have to care about the company. But when you switch over like that, your priorities change. And, you know, he's not going to do something like move them over just because he's a fan of Disney, you know, just or because he worked there in the past. He would only do that if that was the right decision for the MLB. So I don't think you'll see a big immediate uh, or even a, uh, a very overt effect on either Disney or the MLB if this were to ever happen. I think it would be a more behind the scenes. Maybe they'd get a sweeter deal if, you know, it came to ESPN, like, locking television agreements to air MLB games or something like that. You know, just because they have that better relationship, they might be able to close a deal faster and better. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I think it could affect Disney in a negative way if they do create a deal such that Eisner finds a way to break his contract and leave early. That would force Disney to find a new CEO earlier. And rushing a decision like that could always end up, uh, you know, making a bad decision. Not always the case, but it's it's definitely possible. I think it's too, too soon to see. That would be my, my actual answer. Uh, Gimli the Great asks, how do you feel about saving Mr. Banks? And do you think they should make more films like that telling you the origin of the stories? 
Um, so I've talked about Saving Mr. Banks in the past. I thought it was great. I thought it was definitely not a very factual film. It does take a lot of liberties, but I enjoyed it a lot, and I thought it was really well written and well acted and well directed. I would definitely love to see more of the origin of certain stories. Um, I would definitely love to see more of the origin of Disney stories. However, I think for the sake of the accuracy of the films, it would be best if Disney had the foresight to allow outside uh, filmmakers to make it. And that's tough because you'll never see that happen. I mean, I would bet money you'll never, ever see that happen because it's their image. You know, Walt Disney is very much as much of an icon for Disney as Mickey Mouse is. And they're not going to give that up to another company who might just, you know, make them look bad and so it's it's tough i think you won't see any truly objective films on that history until disney as a company doesn't exist any longer and who knows when that will be uh could be could be next year could be never you never know with these things um uh so i mean i'm all for things like saving mr banks as long as people going into it realize that it's going to be Disneyfied and cleaned up and it's not going to be accurate and you know what I'm okay with that too because as somebody who was in film in college and who is a big fan of film I believe that film is meant to be an entertainment medium and I think it's great that some films are inspired by real events but if you want something that's going to be factually accurate to those real events what you really want is a documentary and a documentary about Disney is a whole other topic of conversation and I'm also all for that I think the more people learn about the company the better uh, or else I wouldn't be doing things like this Q&A. Next question comes from Aaron Beatty, who says, Like you said, Disney, or parts of it, have been restricted airspace since 9-11. Why does Disney still have to abide by the 200-foot rule regarding attraction height? Also, if a per person needs to be taken to a hospital by helicopter due to some sort of emergency, where could a helicopter land, especially since Disney would want to not let anyone know? Thanks, and have a great week. So yeah, the Disneys have been restricted airspace since 9-11. They've been considered uh, possible targets of a terrorist attack. And as a result, no, no aircraft can't just fly over it willy-nilly. Uh, but they do have to stick to that rule. Uh, I, I couldn't find a, like, a, a solid reason for this. But my best guess would be that the laws that say that they need to put those lights up supersede any laws that say that, you know, it's restricted airspace. I don't think, you know... The idea that it's a restricted airspace necessarily excuses it from that laws because you know the restricted airspace law is to keep planes out but the um <coughs> the the 200 foot rule is in case planes are low for whatever reason now that said a commercial plane or a large plane can't fly that low anywhere like you can't fly a, a commercial jet at like 250 feet just anywhere that'd be that'd be a big no-no so um Odds are, if a plane is in that area, it's because if it's an emergency, maybe it's like lost or it's crashing, it's having problems. And so that light would still be useful. And that's probably my best guess as to why they would still enforce that rule. Um, as for your second question, there are places for helicopters. Uh, last I checked, there are a couple of helipads here in Epcot, actually, by the Living Seas. And there's a little runway by the Magic Kingdom. Originally, the plan was to have an airstrip that the general public would use on Disney property. And the idea is you would fly to Orlando and then you take a little plane over to Disney. Of course, you know, cars have advanced and we have the bus system and there's no need for that. But there there are ways. And I don't know what the exact procedures would be to allow a medical helicopter to fly in, but I'm sure they're there. You know, just because it's restricted airspace doesn't mean nothing can fly there ever. It just means there are more rules regarding what can and cannot fly there and when. Uh, for instance, I know there was a helicopter flying around the Magic Kingdom recently taking footage for what is rumored to be a new update to Soarin'. Uh, so, you know, planes and aircraft have flown over Disney and are allowed to at times. It's just a little stricter as to when and where. Our next question comes from Nobin Hobbin. <laughs> What's your opinion on 24-hour days? Disney have been, has been having a lot lately, and I was thinking, what is your opinion? I personally do not like this idea, and I don't really see how it could ever make a profit for Disney. Less guests, not as much things open. If you want a lot of guests, then you're going to spend a lot of money on advertising. So what he's talking about, or she is talking about, uh, Disney's doing a 24-hour days where, like, the Magic Kingdom's open for 24 hours. I think it's like 6 a.m. to 6 a.m. the next day. And people go and spend the whole day there. And they do events like every 45 minutes to an hour. So I guess, you know, in the middle of the night, you're not just wandering around bored. 
Uh, what are my opinions? I've never done it before, and maybe it's a sign of me getting old, but I never would do it. Not because I don't think it's fun, but I just... Listen, last time I went, we went during... And we had extra magic hours, and we would go to the parks based on their extra magic hours, and we would rarely stay through the end of those because we were so tired. I can't imagine doing 24 hours at Disney. That's crazy. Uh, but there are diehard fans who do it, and I think the fact that they're limiting it to one day and... Um, I don't know if they've been doing it a lot lately. Last I heard, they were doing like once a year. Um, and I think it's just something to pull in the diehard fans. I would wager that most of the people who take part in it are like Floridians who have season passes. And I think maybe, I mean, there's so much to take into account to even consider whether or not that would be a profitable venture for Disney. I think if they're still doing it, it probably is. But beyond that, I think, you know, if you're talking about how do you keep Disney appealing to people who are um, who are get, uh, annual pass holders who live in the area? You know, I, some people can definitely stand going over and over and over again, but I think other people need that sort of push to go and do something new, and I think this offers something new. You know, uh, as long as the kids can stay up, you know, it's, it's kid-friendly. I don't think it goes against the spirit of Disney so much. I think it's definitely sort of a niche thing. Uh, but I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Uh, I'd, it'd be interesting to see. I don't know. Maybe if anybody's out there taking part of it, I'd love to hear what they think about it. Because I've, I've heard about it. I actually just heard Lou Mangello talking about it on the latest WDW news uh, cast. Uh, but having never taken part, I never really had a stance on it. It's, it's definitely interesting, though. And I think it's one of those things that probably fulfills a thought that somebody... That, like, a lot of people at some point ago or another think about, you know, wouldn't it be cool to be in the park all night and just, like, all hours of the night? That that does kind of sound fun. The actual execution, I don't know so much. Maybe, you know, you do 24 hours in Epcot and then it's just eating all day. Oh, boy. Our next question comes from Daniel Burns, who asks, The first Star Wars standalone film has just been announced. They haven't said what it will be about, but I have a feeling it will be about Boba Fett. What do you think about this, and what would you do for a standalone Star Wars movie? Now, hold on. I think there's another Star Wars question here, so I can throw it in there. Yes, featuring Adam asks, Hey, Rob, big fan. What are your feelings towards making several new Star Wars films? Do you think it's a good idea? Also, I feel they should have waited to see how Star Wars 7 went before writing even more scripts. Thanks, Rob, and have a magical day. So, two issues, but they're all about... Star Wars. Now, they did announce a standalone, uh, and one of the rumors it is, is it is going to be a Boba Fett origin film. Another rumor is that it's going to be a Han Solo origin film. I personally would rather see the Han Solo one. I think Boba Fett is definitely a cool-looking character, and I grew up thinking he was pretty cool, but uh, it's funny, this past weekend during Memorial Day, I actually rewatched the whole trilogy, uh, and I realized that Boba Fett's like a pretty shallow character, and the thing is, he makes a great villain, uh, or a great, like, sub-villain. But to do an origin story means you need an audience to empathize with him and sympathize with him. And I think that takes away from him being the bad guy. You know, like, how do you make a film... How do you make a film where you care about somebody and then they become the bad guy? You know, uh, to step aside for a second, I think um, Breaking Bad does a fantastic job of that. They They take a character and they show you his downfall his breaking bad yet you still sympathize and empathize with him but the problem is that took many years and many many episodes to get that a point because that sort of transition takes a really long time to pull off i think part of the reason the prequels weren't great was because they tried to you know the goal was here we're going to show you how anakin goes from good to bad but we're going to do it in three films and not even really three films. We're going to show you in like one and a half. And that's not enough time to make it convincing and to make you care. And so I wouldn't really want to see a Boba Fett origin film as uh, believe it or not. Maybe a film about Boba Fett where Boba Fett's not the protagonist, but the antagonist. Uh, or maybe an anti-hero that might work, I guess. Um, but I would much rather see a Han Solo thing. Now, as for, you know, seeing all these films, you know, they've Disney's announced that s starting with Episode 7, they want to do a Disney film every year. So it'd be like Episode 7, a standalone, Episode 8, a standalone, Episode 9, standalone, so on and so forth. Um, should they have waited? I feel like they've got a grasp on talent enough. I mean, the good analogy here is to look at Marvel. Like, should they have waited for, you know, I guess Disney had the 
had the luxury of having seen how Iron Man did before they acquired it, because if I believe it, yeah, the Iron Man's came out before the Avengers and everything. Um, the problem is, if you wait and see, the thing is, making a movie takes a long time, and the reason they're staggering it like this is so that they can have a regular release schedule. Now, you want to take a look at a great example of a movie that did well, that sort of lost its momentum, at least in my opinion, is Avatar. Avatar opened is one of the biggest selling films of all time. I thought it was just run of the mill average okay, but you know, enough people saw that it was major. And where's Avatar 2 and 3? We've been waiting for it because they didn't really start on Avatar 2 and 3 until after 1 uh, was really, really good. So I think this, this style works, and I think Disney is responsible enough to get the talent needed to make them, at the very least, decent films, so I'm not too worried about them doing it like this. And I think the key is keeping enough variety. You know, somebody goes, oh, Star Wars film every year, gonna be sick of Star Wars. Well, how many of you guys are sick of Marvel? Like, I, I'm not, personally, because it's different every time. You know, this this summer it was Captain America, and maybe, you know, then, uh, then you've got the Guardians of the Galaxy, and you've got things like this, so, you know, it keeps it fresh, so it's not just uh, the same thing over and over and over again. Now, had they done Iron Man 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 every year, yeah, that would have gotten old super fast. Now, Star Wars, it has to be the same, I think. I think the idea of breaking up the trilogy, similar to the way they're breaking up the Avengers... Uh, and hopefully these standalones are different enough that they offer just enough variety that, you know, you could even pick and choose. You know, the standalones have a benefit of, well, maybe you're not a fan of Boba Fett. You don't watch the Boba Fett movie. But you're a fan of Han Solo, you watch the Han Solo movie. And you get to watch what entertains you and you get to skip what doesn't. And there's something for everybody. So I'm all for it. Next question comes from Lunar Distortion who asks, Hey Rob, what are your thoughts on the upcoming Marvel movie Big Hero 6? They just released a trailer for it and I think it could be pretty good. Uh, so just to clarify, that's actually not a Marvel movie. Big Hero 6 is a Disney animated studios film. So it's the guys who, it's the studio that put out Frozen, that put out Wreck-It Ralph. Um, I mean, they're all owned by the same parent company, but uh, it's not like based on a Marvel property. At least I don't think it would make sense for them at that point to do it under Marvel, but they're doing it under Disney. Um, yeah, the trailer came out. I thought it was really cute. I'm looking forward to it. There's not a lot to talk about. It's more of a teaser. I think within the teaser, they already made a good job of giving uh, this big Hero 6, this big white robot um, that's like sort of bouncy and rubbery, a lot of lovable characters. So I don't know. We'll see. It comes out in like February next year. So I'm looking forward to it. That'll be fun. Uh, our next question comes from, uh, let's go with featuring Adam again, who asks, what attractions have you personally enjoyed, but think should be removed to achieve the endless change Walt was looking for? Thanks, Rob. Keep being awesome. This is a great question. Uh, what, what would I remove that I really enjoyed for the sake of the endless, uh, change Walt was looking for? I think, ooh, man. So it's like, which, which ones do I like that I would sacrifice for this, this, this dream ah i'll pick one from each park so hollywood studios i would say redo the great uh no i don't uh, yeah remove the great movie ride i love that ride so much but i think uh if its goal is to teach you the history of filmmaking or film it needs to be, if not removed, but just completely revamped 100% because I think it shows a lot of film up until, you know, the uh, the 80s when it was created. But beyond that, there's so much that's happened to film since then. You know, there's so many, you know, this digital revolution. Uh, I think part of it was also Eisner was big on creating that ride to promote Disney. And you have most films that... Disney either had access to the library to through MGM's partnership or it was a Disney film or, you know, that one standout of Alien. But I think if they took some of these buckets and buckets of money that they're getting from Frozen and all of this Marvel stuff and Star Wars and licensed enough film to do a, you know, a respectful and accurate depiction of the history of film that, you know, ignores the loyalties of the fact that Disney owns film studios and shows stuff that maybe even their competitors would have done. I think that'd be awesome. Uh, Magic Kingdom, I would say, ooh, this is tough. The, the, I don't know. 
I feel like a lot of the Fantasyland rides you could probably redo or update or refurbish, I guess. Like, um, put some new fantasy stuff in there. Like, take out Peter Pan and put in a Princess and the Frog ride or something like that, I guess. And then Hollywood... Oh, wait, we did Hollywood Studios. Epcot. Here at Epcot. Uh, oh, forget about it. I, I mean, I won't even list anything here. I'm doing a whole series on what I would do to change it. I have no problem changing Epcot for the better. Great question, though. That's one I would pose on all of you, the viewers. Which ones would you like to see changed? Even though you really enjoyed it, just to keep Disney fresh. And lastly this week, we are going to turn to... Let's see. Nat Nat Dancer 83001 who asks, Disney has have announced that they're making a Toy Story 4 if Tom Hanks agrees to make it. What do you think it would be about? Second question, what are some of your favorite Disney movies from the late 60s through the 70s? Thank you, Natalie. Uh, so Disney, it was actually a flip. So Tom Hanks and Tim Allen have agreed that if Disney creates a Toy Story 4, they're on board. Disney itself has not announced any plans to do Toy Story 4. Um, I believe the director, Lee, and I can never pronounce his last name, Ulrich, Ulrich, or something with a U, uh, has said that they have no plans right now to do Toy Story 4. That doesn't mean that you won't see Buzz or Woody in the future, just that they're not planning on it. So there's nothing in the works. What it would be about, I don't know. I hope it would be sort of a... I guess it would follow the new, the new child that owns these toys, whose name I forget. Uh, but, uh, you know, I kind of hope they let it lie. I think that was a great trilogy, and I don't think we really need to see a Toy Story 4. Secondly, favorite films of the 60s and 70s. This is actually one of my favorite time periods for Disney film. Uh, and I think part of that is because Walt was involved in the 60s, uh, more so than the 70s. He wasn't around in the 70s. And I think it's just sort of the, the film and the audio and just the way everything looked and felt in that era just has this big throwback to when Disney was in its infancy and it was Disneyland. And so, you know, it just reminds me of like this golden era of Disney. And so my favorites have to be the parent trap for one. Uh, and Mary Poppins up there as a close second in the animated space. You had that sword in the stone. Uh, the jungle book was like right after Walt had died. And that was actually criticized, I think as being one of the lazier films because it reused a lot of animation and it wasn't a very creative film. Uh, I think that was still at the point where they were still in shock as a company that Walt had died and they didn't know what to do next. So they just sort of tried to make a movie they thought Disney would make. And it felt that way. It felt like, you know, not a genuine Disney film, but a what would Disney do film. Uh, but I grew up with it. So I sort of has a soft spot in my heart. Uh, Robin Hood in the 70s was one that I really enjoyed mainly because I grew up with it. Uh, but Parent Trap and Mary Poppins, like those movies I could watch many, many times. I really, really enjoy them. Uh, and again, it's just that look and feel is just such a classic Disney feel to it. Anyway, I want to thank everybody for the questions this week. Again, this series is going to be a um, weekly series going forward. So if you've got any questions regarding the parks, the servers, uh, the animations, you name it, throw them my way in the comments. I try to get to all of them as much as possible. I want to thank you all for watching. If you've enjoyed this, I have other content that's all uh, Minecraft Disney related, including the history of some rides and uh, top fives that I've been doing with Christine, which is a lot of fun and stuff like that. And I also have some regular Minecraft stuff like, um, you know, our survival series, our creative series. And I have another channel called Rob Plays Those Games, which is a Let's Play channel devoted to games that are not Minecraft related. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Rob Plays. Uh, I have t-shirts in the store now, and I've actually come up with a better way of uh, getting them printed, a cheaper way of getting them printed. So now shirts aren't ridiculously expensive. They're like $13 across the board. I actually have them now. Uh, I'm wearing one this moment. I enjoy it. It's a text logo, and I have a logo logo. Um, I'm also, I also have a subreddit. We used to have forms. I'm sort of getting with the times. Uh, so I've sort of switched from the forms to the subreddit. So if you go to Reddit slash r slash Rob Plays, that's the Rob Plays subreddit. And it's all Disney and gaming related. Anyway, have a great week. Thanks for the questions, everybody. And I hope to see you here next week for the next Minecraft Disney Q&A. Bye, everybody.